Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 uh, Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. Um, I'm Kenneth Armstrong. I'm Professor of Euro uh, European Law at the uh, Faculty of Law here in Cambridge. Um, now, this ought to have been actually the 25th uh, annual Mackenzie Stewart Lecture, but uh, we had a bit of a hiatus last year, so it's extremely nice to be able to hold this year's lecture and to be able to hold it uh, in person. We're delighted and honoured that um, the lecture will be given this evening by uh, Professor Stephen Weatherall, Emeritus Jacques Delors Professor of European Law at the University of Oxford and the Fellow of Somerville College. Uh, Steve took the chair in 1998, uh, just as the Mackenzie Stewart Lecture Series uh, was being inaugurated. Uh, the Mackenzie Stewart Lecture was intended to provide an annual uh, focal point for reflection on the, the key European issues of the day. And the lecture has been delivered by political and uh, legal figures who in their own professional careers have made significant contributions to our understanding of European law and European integration. And as an eminent scholar and author of numerous books and articles, uh, Professor Weatherall is a fitting person to give this year's annual lecture. This is, however, I think a somber moment for Europe. And the inv invasion of Ukraine and the Russian, uh, by Russian forces, has been both unimaginable and unconscionable. And the loss of life in a war in Europe was the very thing that a process of European integration was intended to avoid. So as we once again enjoy the freedom to come together here um, as a community and to debate and discuss European law and European issues. I think we do so in the knowledge that the freedom of others, indeed their very lives are being taken away. Now the subject of tonight's lecture is one that I know is very close to Professor Wetherill's heart. But let me hand over now to my colleague, Professor Catherine Barnard, who will more formally introduce Steve and the lecture that he's going to give this evening. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great delight to be here in person. Steve Wetherill is a remarkable academic. He doesn't uh, fit the natural mold of stuffy, tweed-wearing, conservative Oxford Don. <coughs> Quite the contrary. When I see him in those days when we used to meet more regularly, he was more often wearing a whole city football shirt. I'm saddened that he hasn't donned it this evening. And talking passionately about his team. His team could be Hull City or indeed Scotland and certainly not about the niceties of high table and whether the crocuses have come into flower in good time. However, he's remarkable in another way that he's carved out not only a niche in high quality, but highly accessible scholarship. As for his scholarship, you see this through the 12 um, editions of his insightful cases and materials book, which is a model of combining description and analysis, but also through the explorations of consumer law, sports law, about which you're going to hear much more later on. Now, I could list for you the extraordinary range of his publications, but I think you'll know them, which is why you're here. I would prefer to talk about his contribution as he has just taken his retirement. So I say he combines a clarity of thought and deep insight with the most wonderful turn of phrase. Most recently, I was struck by this in his work on the fiendishly complicated Northern Ireland Protocol. 
With his usual insight, he stripped the protocol of its verbiage and summarized it as what it says is not what it does. I noticed that this pithy exposition has been picked up by the drafters of the protocol, who in their commentary on the text expressly say they hope to provide clarity, not only about what the protocol says, but also what it does. Now, as Steve's web website explains, even in retirement, he will continue writing about a variety of topics, including, and I quote, the many misrepresentations that propelled and continued to propel Brexit, in particular with reference to the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol and the, um, the citing of a hardened regulatory and customs border within the UK. I have always admired Steve from afar. It's to his work that I always turn first. He is a Renaissance man who has a breadth across EU law, which many of us can but dream of. I've always thought his insights into the operation of the EU's internal market, and more recently into the UK's own internal market are second to none. When students are looking for a model as to how to write, it's to Steve's work that I always refer them. I've struck recently that there were complaints on Twitter that academic writing is rewarded for its obscurity rather than its clarity. I've always thought that's nonsense, and I have learned that from the master. Steve has led the way in showing that academic writing can be both high quality, high level, and highly engaging. And generations of students have benefited from this. He's much loved by undergraduates and graduates alike. His lectures are legendary with his distinctive style of delivery, which you'll see later. I want to return to Steve's love of sport. He's always been a passionate football fan, and he loves cricket too. And throughout all the time that I've had the privilege of knowing him, he has supported bad teams with an enthusiasm and an alacrity that only a Norwich City fan like myself can share. It's to my great sadness that Steve has decided to take early retirement, and I'm in no way envious that he will be able to follow the England cricket team on their tour of the West Indies, leaving for Antigua on Sunday. I'm glad that Steve will carry on writing and offering his insights into what is going to be a period of considerable activity at EU level and where the UK will have to find a way of both engaging with the EU, but also managing the new relationship with the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement. For now, I want you to sit back and enjoy what will be a feast for eyes and ears. Steve Wetherill, thank you very much indeed for your lecture. Well, thank you so much for those warm words of welcome, Kenneth and Catherine, and thank you very much for the invitation to deliver this lecture, which is certainly one of the most important on the European Union law circuit. So, the catastrophes of Brexit are collapsing all around us. The rule of law is threatened most of all in Poland and in Hungary. Worst of all, Russia is invading Ukraine. And I'm going to talk about football. Seriously? Okay. It's an apology for my triviality. And yet, football is not important, but it's, as famous manager said, the most important, unimportant thing in the world. Football does repay attention. And of course, I'm not just going to talk about football. I'm going to talk about the proper scope of European Union law, the proper scope of the European Union's authority. If we talk about sports governance generally, governing bodies will tell you that they have a legitimate claim to autonomy. They mean autonomy from legal control. They mean autonomy from political interference. They mean that they, as sports governing bodies, have better expertise to understand what sport needs than do judges or politicians. They will tell you that sports bodies need to have autonomy in order to operate on a global basis, 
to set rules which apply in common across the whole planet so that the sport means the same thing whichever country you practice it in. It shouldn't, sports governing bodies will tell you, be subject to variation based on the application of local laws. And in practice, sports governing bodies are pretty good at insulating their activities from legal review. Autonomy is achieved through the dispute resolution systems, which are structured within sport, with the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne at the apex. So most disputes in sport are handled, as it were, in-house. Commitments are made within the statutes of governing bodies not to proceed before the ordinary courts of states, but rather to submit to the dispute resolution procedures foreseen by the relevant sport. So the so-called Lex Sportiva develops as a kind of internal sports law, which is quite separate from what we would understand as ordinary law of states or of international organizations. So for example, Milan were found to have violated the UEFA rules on financial fair play. They were initially subject to a two year ban from European competition as a result. The CAS found flaws in the process and remitted the decision for reconsideration. Subsequently, it was decided that the two year ban would be upheld unless Milan was shown to be compliant with the financial fair play rules by a specific date. Then subsequently, again, a consent award was struck between UEFA and Milan, in which the club accepted a one-year ban from European competition in season uh, 2019-20. The details don't worry us. The point is that all that is handled through the internal processes of the sport. It goes nowhere near courts of law. Okay, so autonomy is the claim that sports governing bodies make as the paradigm structure. Is there a problem? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a problem. You know who the man on the right is. The man on the left, you probably know too. It's the man on the left is Gianni Infantino, who is the president of FIFA. And that uh, gruesome twosome there are uh, at the 2018 World Cup, which was held in Russia. There's President Putin handing a medal to Gianni Infantino for his services to the Russian state. The similarity is remarkable. <laughs> See? Separated at birth? Well, I'm here to tell you that Dick Dastardly and Muckley have got nothing on Infantino and Putin. And it's not just the last World Cup, it's the next one as well. The 2022 World Cup will be held in Qatar. In 2013, Sepp Blatter, who at the time was the FIFA president, has admitted that world football cannot turn a blind eye to the deaths of hundreds of construction workers in Qatar as the country prepares to host the 2022 World Cup. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it has. I had to provide a, a list of the types of problems which afflict sports governing bodies and which are reasons why should we should be skeptical about their claims to autonomy. I would list these in transparency absence of adequate representation and accountability. Sports governing bodies are typically governed by administrators. There's very little voice for athletes. There's no voice for fans. So affected interests are not represented adequately in decision-making processes. Equality. Almost all sports governing bodies are run by people who look like me, old white men. And there's corruption as well, periodically. But in fact, the, the real problems, the deep problems are not about corruption. The deep problems are about the structure of sports governing bodies. There is an endemic conflict of interest in sports governance today. 
Typically, sports governing bodies were set up a hundred and more years ago to set the rules of their sport. They were regulators. They had to decide what the nature of the sport was and what its rules were. That's still needed today. They had no commercial motivation. They had no commercial activity. Sport was not commercially significant in the distant past. Now it is. Sport is now very big business. But what's happened is that sports governing bodies have incrementally rolled up their regulatory functions with their commercial activities. There's no separation. It's all part of the same process of decision making, a closed system of decision making. In short, the structure of sports governing bodies dictates that self interest rules. Most of all, there is a severe risk that regulatory decisions are contaminated by commercial motivations. So the sport is structured and run in such a way as to maximize the profit-making possibilities of the governing body. For the good of the game. The FIFA slogan, well, perhaps, but it's certainly for the good of FIFA's bank balance. Can we expect governing bodies in sport to reform themselves? No, I don't think so. If the endemic problem is self-interested activities by the governing body, then they're not going to change. There's not going to be change driven from within. So the question is, who should intervene and how? My claim this evening is that the European Union is the best and perhaps only place to look if we want to see an improvement in the governance of sport across the world. The European Union has a geographical claim. Most sports governing bodies are based in Europe, not in the European Union, but in Switzerland, but in Europe. Most of the money made in the major sports of the world is made in Europe. The European Union has a principled claim to be an effective regulator of sports. The European Union itself is transnational in a way that sports are. Further point is the European Union's resistance to sanctioning. There are 209 members of FIFA. If one state on its own seeks to take on FIFA, it's not likely to have any great success. It would just be one voice in the wilderness and FIFA has the powers under its statutes, statutes to suspend football associations from activity if their governments review the activities of FIFA and no government wishes to see its country, its team removed from the World Cup. Now the European Union doesn't suffer from that disincentive to intervene. The European Union doesn't have a team in the World Cup and although FIFA could I suppose suspend all 27 teams which are found within the European Union the result would be a World Cup that was of no appeal to fans or broadcasters or sponsors. So the European Union, I think uniquely, is strong enough to require change in sports governance if it does choose to intervene. And because it's not likely that if the EU forces change, there will then be sports rules for the EU and sports rules for the rest of the world. The reality is that EU-induced change will have implications across the whole of the world. It's a kind of Brussels effect for sport. What I want to do is to take you through the conventional story of EU sports law which is the subjection of the Lex Sportiva to free movement law and to competition law, and then turn to what I think could be the next chapter in EU sports law, which is what the EU should do. It's whether the EU should be more assertive than it has been so far. So part one, the conventional story of EU sports law, part two, how EU sports law could be 
if he used sports lawyers to have any role, it has to get beyond the claim to autonomy which sports governing bodies make, particularly in the name of arbitration and the role of the Court of Arbitration of Sport. European Union law does look beyond arbitral finality. In the Mecca and Medina case, which concerns the compatibility of anti-doping rules with EU competition law, a complaint was made by swimmers that a ban which had been upheld by the Court of Arbitration for Sport violated EU competition law. The swimmers complaint failed, but at no stage did the Court of Justice suggest that a CAS ruling would not be reviewed by the EU uh, courts simply because it was the product of the arbitral process? That's to say, where EU competition law is concerned, arbitral finality is set aside. And the Court emphasized that point in the Echo Suisse case, where it held that competition law is a matter of public policy within the New York Convention, with the consequence that national courts within the European Union must set aside arbitral finality insofar as the arbitral award is contaminated by violation of EU competition law. But the courts never said so. The same must also apply to an arbitral award that violates free movement law. So the EU approach is to insist on a hierarchical preference for protection of competition law and free movement law ahead of arbitral finality. There are also, of course, disputes involving EU law where the CAS's jurisdiction is not engaged, such as those involving broadcasting rights. But basically, as a result of the approach taken by the court, the European Union is relatively intolerant of sporting autonomy. The Lex Sportiva must comply with the public policy principles which are contained in European Union law. That means most of all, sport, sporting bodies within the European Union must comply with free movement law, competition law, <coughs> non-discrimination rules, governing nationality and probably other horizontally applicable fundamental rights as well. So the conventional story of EU sports law is exactly the subjection of sporting practices to free movement law and competition law. But the practice of the Court of Justice shows that it is prepared in applying free movement and competition law to sport to take account of the extent to which sport may claim to have special features which urge for a more sympathetic interpretation of EU law when it comes into collision with sporting choices. And the best place to go to understand what's at stake there is the landmark case decided by the Court of Justice in Bosman. In Bosman, the Court of Justice said this, in view of the considerable social importance of sporting activities, and in particular football in the community, the aims of maintaining a balance between clubs by preserving a certain degree of equality and uncertainty as to results, and of encouraging the recruitment and training of young players must be accepted as legitimate. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from the treaty, Really at the time didn't even mention sport. It doesn't come from any legislative text either. There was no legislation which addressed the matter. That is the court's adventurous, creative interpretation of EU free movement law in the context of sport. And specifically in Bosman, the Court of Justice held that the transfer system, as then applied, was incompatible with the EU free movement law because it prevented players moving between clubs even where their contract of employment had come to an end. <laughs> but the Court of Justice did not rule against the existence in principle of a transfer system, even though you would not 
find a transfer system in a typical employment relationship because it, the Court of Justice, accepted in this quote, the considerable social importance of sporting activities and the need for um, rules which reflect that to preserve a certain degree of equality, uncertainty, to encourage youth training. So the transfer system lived on after Bosman, albeit slimmed down. Maker Medina is the case I mentioned earlier concerning anti-doping sanctions reviewed in the light of competition law. Court of Justice similarly adopted an interpretation of EU law which was attuned to the special claims, the special sensitivities that arose in the sporting context. So the court said, anti-doping um, rules, procedures, sanctions do not necessarily constitute a restriction of competition since they're justified by a legitimate objective. Such a limitation is inherent in the organization and proper conduct of competitive sport, and its very purpose is to ensure healthy rivalry between athletes. Again, that comes from nowhere but the Court of Justice's own creative interpretation of competition law in the particular context of anti-doping in sport. And the court is therefore applying EU law, but taking account of the context in which EU law operates, specifically the need to ensure healthy sport. The Moto case concerns the powers of a sports governing body to authorize or to refuse events put on by third party organizers. This was addressed in the light of competition law, specifically Article 102, concerning the abuse of a dominant position. Sports governing bodies usually hold a dominant position, that's the whole point. There needs to be one sporting body that sets the rules for the whole sport. In Moto, which concerned a rather detailed issue, namely the licensing of motorcycling events in Greece, the court said Article 102 precludes a national rule which confers on a legal person which organizes motorcycling events and enters into sponsorship, advertising, and insurance contracts, the power to give consent to applications for authorization to organize such competitions without that power being made subject to restrictions, obligations, and review. So to equip a sports governing body with the power to decide which events are allowed without that power being subject to restrictions, obligations, and review is abusive and unlawful within the meaning of EU law. But the court is not there ruling against the power of a sports governing body to decide which events are allowed and which are not. It's simply ruling against the use of that power in a way that is uncontrolled, unreviewed, and arbitrary. So the court is not there ruling out a gatekeeping function exercised by a sports governing body, but it is insisting that that gatekeeping function be performed in a way which does not advantage the governing body's own events at the expense of third party organizers. Exactly that principle was seen again in the International Skating Union case, where the union had been seen to place heavy penalties on skaters who chose to participate in events run by third party organizers. The court held that the skating union's penalties were disproportionately restrictive and unlawful, but it did not deny that the skating union had a legitimate role in deciding the calendar for the sport. The general court accepted that a governing body may protect the integrity of its sport. That's a legitimate objective recognized by EU law. What matters is the particular circumstances within which that power is exercised. Exactly these questions will 
be at stake when the European Super League case is decided by the Court of Justice. That's a case where UEFA has imposed penalties on football clubs that chose to participate in the short-lived, ill-fated European Super League. The question in the reference made by a court of trade is whether it is compatible with EU law for UEFA to impose sanctions on a third party competition. The legal context is that the case law shows that sports governing bodies have a legitimate gatekeeping role. What matters is the precise way in which that um, function is carried out. And most of all, the concern is that sports governing bodies shall not suffer from a conflict of interest within which they may be tempted to privilege their own events at the expense of those put on by third party organizers. So the issue there is right at the um, margin between the regulatory role of sports governing bodies and the commercial incentives of sports governing bodies to prefer particular competitions. So in sum, the European Union does not accept absolute sporting autonomy. The European Union does not say, sports, get on with it. Instead, it puts sporting practices to the test. Sporting autonomy is recognized by European Union law on condition that it is demonstrated what the purpose of the sporting practices are, and that the way in which they are structured is the least restrictive that is needed to achieve the end in view. And there is what I would call a sporting margin of appreciation in the court's case law, in the sense that the court in applying EU law does show a degree of deference to the choices made by sports governing bodies about how to structure their sport. So no to the particular transfer system attacked in Bosman, but yes to a transfer system in principle. Yes to anti-doping procedures in Mecca Medina, and yes to a legitimate gatekeeping rule, role performed by sports governing bodies in Moto and International Skating Union. All this has, since 2009, been wrapped up in the treaty direction in Article 165 TFEU that the Union shall contribute to the promotion of European sporting issues while taking account of the specific nature of sport. Well, the Court of Justice has been doing that for a very long time. That's no more than a codification of the Court's approach in the interpretation and application of EU free movement law and competition law to sport. But, and here I'm moving from part one, the conventional story of EU sports law, to part two, what EU sports law may become. So the but, the but is that currently EU intervention is typically reactive and ad hoc. Bosman. Eka Medina, Moto, International Skating Union, they're, they're intriguing decisions. The way in which the court tries to mediate between the claims of sporting autonomy and the EU internal market are fascinating, I think. But those cases get to the court after harm's been done. They get there on a very ad hoc basis. They really are the accidents of litigation. How on earth Greek motorcycling events reached Luxembourg? We can't really. No. And most of all, in these cases, the court is deciding on what may not be done. All these decisions are to the effect that a particular practice is or is not compatible with the EU competition law or free movement law. So the EU says what may not be done. It doesn't direct how sport shall structure its activities or its governance systems. And all this is mediated through Free movement law, competition law, there's no general jurisdiction for the Court of Justice to review choices made within sport. I don't want to discount the extent to which reactive ad hoc decisions can change sporting practice. The International Skating Union decision 
in which it was held that it was unlawful to impose heavy penalties on athletes who chose to compete in non-authorized competitions did generate change in other sports. So um, FINA, the swimming, the governing body for swimming, did change its practices on the matter of unauthorized competitions in the light of the commission decision in International Skating Union. So there is some spillover effect of an individual decision taken by the commission. Similarly, the transfer system was renegotiated after the Bosman decision and one of the outcomes of the renovated transfer system was that it was a subject of an, an exchange of letters agreeing to the new system between Mario Monti, then the responsible commission, uh, competition commissioner, and Sepp Blatter, the president of FIFA. Something similar happened with UEFA's financial fair play rules, where the compatibility of those rules with the EU law was uh, recorded green light in an exchange of letters between Commissioner Al Munia and Michel Platini, the president of UEFA at the time. These exchanges of letters are legally ambiguous. They're certainly not binding, and they certainly don't set aside the authority of the Court of Justice to decide on whether these practices truly conform with European Union law. But clearly there was a degree of negotiation here involving the Commission in the shadow of EU law as interpreted by the court. So the Commission does have a degree of negotiating power in renovating sporting practices. But even so, there's no legislative mandate. This is reactive, this is ad hoc. There's no legislative mandate. There's no proactive role played by the European Union in structuring sports governance and sports practices. So could it be different? Could it be different? Could should the European Union be more proactive? In these conclusions of the Council on combating corruption in sport, we learn that sports governing bodies should be able to maintain a high degree of autonomy in fulfilling their role in all fields of sport. This comes with an implicit recognition that any such autonomy must be earned through good governance and upholding the highest standards of integrity in their sport. But EU decisions, court decisions, do nudge in that direction. One of the points of the decision in the Moto case and in the International Skating Union case was exactly that it was up to sports bodies to decide on the structuring of their gatekeeping role, up to sports bodies to organize the calendar for the sport, but on condition that decisions be taken transparently in a non-discriminatory manner, in a reviewable manner in a way which ensured that the conflict of interests under which the sports governing body labors is suppressed. But the conclusions continue to tell us that the basic principles of good governance in sport include as a minimum requirement, democratic structures, regular and open electoral procedures, competent and ethical organization and management, accountability and transparency in decision-making and financial operations, as well as fairness in dealing with membership, including as regards gender equality and solidarity. You're not gonna get to that through the application of competition law or free movement law. You're only get, gonna get to that by regulating sport, ex ante, directly to set these standards as preconditions for exercising sporting activities on the territory of the European Union. The Committee on Culture and Education of the European Parliament recently referred to a European sports model that recognizes the need for a strong commitment to integrating the principles of solidarity, sustainability, inclusiveness, open competition and sporting merit. Good governance, diversity, inclusion, non-discrimination. You only get to that by regulating sport. 
not by falling back on ad hoc reactive application of competition law. Resolution of the Council and representatives of the Member States on the key features of a European sports model adopted right at the end of last year described the European sports model as containing features such as freedom of association, the pyramidal structure, an open system of promotion and relegation, grassroots approach and solidarity, a role in national identity, community building, and structures based on voluntary activity as well as its social, educational, cultural, and health functions. Again, you only get there through legislating. There's even been a European Citizens Initiative lately registered uh, with the Commission, urging that the European Union shall protect a European model of sport based on values, solidarity, sustainability, and open competition. You only get that by legislating. If you consider the European Super League litigation, you can see how significant it would be were the European Union to move beyond the ad hoc reactive conventional model of EU sports law and instead to embrace an ex ante regulatory function. In, in the European Super League case, that the clubs are claiming that they wish to put on a new breakaway league, which will improve competition. It will simply be a new product in the market. For the advantage of consumer choice. It's a pretty strong argument. UEFA's uh, argument in uh, opposition to that is in short that UEFA wishes to defend the integrity of the sport, specifically of the European sport model, because UEFA claim that in Europe, football is based on open leagues, promotion and relegation. It's based on merit-based qualification. And UEFA take the view that their role is to protect those values and to impose sanctions on clubs that wish to damage those values. That's the case, that's the litigation, which the court is going to have to resolve. I feel rather sorry for it. It's a very difficult issue for the court. It may well find that the reference is hypothetical and therefore inadmissible. It may well pitch an answer at a very abstract level, but it's a very difficult job for the court to handle because it's dealing with such woolly, vague material. So what the court's being asked to do in that case is to define the extent to which EU law defends a European sports model. But it can only get to that by deciding whether or not UEFA is in breach of EU competition law by imposing sanctions on the clubs who wish to join the breakaway league. So there's a pretty poor fit between the big issue is the European sport model should be defended? And the more focused issue, which is at the heart of the litigation, which is whether there's a breach of EU competition law. So wouldn't it be easier if there was regulatory intervention, if there was an ex ante regulatory set of standards defining what a European sports model might be? It would be politically legitimate. It would be relatively predictable. The claim is a need to move beyond competition law to regulation. And if you want an analogy, the analogy would be with digital markets, where the assumption has increasingly been that competition law is an inadequate tool to discipline the power of the big platform operators, where instead, Ex ante regulation is needed to set the standards which must be met by any powerful actor which wishes to operate in European digital markets. The terminology suggests the analogy. We talk about uh, platforms as gatekeepers. Well, governing bodies in sport are gatekeepers as well. And arguably, they too should be subject to the same sorts of ex ante regulation as we're finding emerging in digital markets. <laughs> 
So my claim is that the European Union should take a more, more proactive role as a sports regulator. It needs to move beyond the conventional story of EU sports law, which is ad hoc and reactive, and it needs instead to be engaged with regulating standards that must be met as a precondition to operating as a sports governing body within the European Union. That's to say, autonomy of sports governing bodies should not be tolerated on the terms which apply today. Now, of, of course, that raises both constitutional questions and substantive questions. The constitutional questions are, does the European Union have the legal competence to adopt such rules? There are some candidate provisions of the treaty. Um, I'm just going to say that although it's not true that the European Union can do anything through harmonization, it is true to say it can do a great deal through harmonization. I would feel fairly confident that I could construct a constitutional argument that there is sufficient diversity in national practice on good governance standards that the European Union is entitled to set harmonized standards on good governance in sport as a contribution to the good functioning of the internal market. So I think there's an adequate legal base for EU ex ante regulation of sports governance under Articles 53, 1, 62, and 114 TFEU, the legal basis which equip the Union with the competence to harmonize laws. The substantive questions are all about relative expertise. Does the European Union know enough to engage in regulating sport? Can it claim legitimacy given that it doesn't have a well-developed competence in the field of sport? Is there a risk of fragmentation? If the EU regulates sport, may that lead to the damage to the global pattern of common rules of to which sport, on which sport rests such faith? So the EU has to show that it can add value. I think the EU clearly can be involved in dialogue, in, exchange, in encouraging the exchange of best practices and encouraging institutional cooperation. But I do think the EU has a sufficient claim to go beyond competition law to regulation, to pursue targeted legislative proactivity because of the existing deficiencies in sports governance to which I've referred, which are not going to be rectified from within sport. Exactly how far EU ex ante regulation should go is clearly something that would need careful discussion and would be politically sensitive. I would suggest that um, it should cover questions of representation. It should cover questions of free and fair elections. It should, should consider issues associated with term limits for those who are involved in the governance of sports. It should involve clear rules governing the rights of third party organizers, which in turn should generate a concern to enforce a separation in sports governing bodies between the regulatory function and the commercial function. Sports governing bodies should have a regulatory function. They inevitably have a commercial function. The two need to be kept separate to avoid the conflict of interest, which is at the heart of so many current problems in sports governance. Whether we want to go so far as to have the EU dictate that sporting competition should be open, promotion and relegation, and should be qualified and should have qualification based on merit is another question again. How far should the European Union go in dictating the shape of a European model of sports? That's an issue that clearly needs to be on the table. I would also think that club ownership is an issue that could profitably be placed on the table. Perhaps we need some ethical standards in order to determine who should be engaged in owning our great football clubs. Perhaps we need a higher level of fan representation. Football's taken some terribly wrong turnings in recent years. So my claim is that the European Union is 
uniquely well-placed to improve the quality of governance in sport. That it should be more proactive, not to the extent of displacing the primary role of governing bodies as regulators of their sport, but rather to improve governance by governing bodies. And there I will finish. Thank you. Thank you.